A lot of people ask me if, if uh, I could influence the future of AI more from within Google than from outside Google. Believe it or not, it's not up to the technology anymore. So, you know, the way AI machines are learning is they are observing massive amounts of data. The code itself is the small piece of the work. It's the patterns that they observe that make them develop certain forms of intelligence. But, but the behavior we input into it is what really makes the difference. That, that, that is something I can influence much more from outside Google than from within where the code is written. It's not about the code anymore. It's about our code of conduct, if you want, how we conduct ourselves, how we, how we interact with the world. This truly is how we're going to reshape our future into one where the right values, happiness and compassion, create a, a, a machine intelligence that prioritizes those. And so accordingly, a life where it's a lot more utopian than the things that you see in science fiction movies. I had the tremendous pleasure of interviewing the brilliant Mo Gaudat four years ago already. But instead of losing relevance, it only gained in significance. So let's fast forward to today, where AI is rapidly weaving itself into our lives through remarkable tools like ChatGPT and MidJourney. And as I revisited the complete interview recorded four years ago, a revelation dawned upon me. Mo's remarkable foresight and perspective on AI have only grown in relevance. What was once an illuminating conversation has now become even more intriguing and pertinent than we could have ever imagined at the moment we originally captured it. Yeah, I'm Mo. I uh, am no longer at Google X. I was the chief business officer for around four and a half years. And uh, I'm the author of uh, Solve for Happy. And I am uh, the founder of OneBillionHappy.org, which is now the reason for my existence. Uh, I wrote the book uh, in an attempt to honor my son. I lost uh, Ali uh, when, um, when he was 21 and a half to preventable medical error. And so, uh, you know, Ali was my idol, my happiness idol. I learned so much from him on the topic of happiness. And somehow, instead of, you know, how, how people would want to avenge the life of their son, I wanted to give life for my son's life. Uh, I also believe that there is a, um, a sense of urgency to the, um, to the mission of happiness. It's, uh, it's, it's no secret that today's world is full of unhappiness, how uh, critical it is for us as a species to, to survive in the world of artificial intelligence uh, if we were not to uh, teach the machines the right value set. And in my personal view, point of view, the, the right value set is happiness and compassion. And I think we have somewhere around 10 to 12 years to get this mission done. My main focus is to change people's minds so that they realize that happiness is the right. That that whole, you know, confusion we started to develop in the modern world, that it's okay to be unhappy, you know, it's okay, fine. It's the price you pay to be successful. That's absolute nonsense. What would our world look like? You know how the smartest people in our lifetime came up with the most amazing things that you and I enjoy? Uh, we're just, we've just given birth to someone who's a lot smarter, right? Someone who is going to be able to look at information wide and far and deep and communicate really well with his peers or her peers or I don't know, its peers, whichever way you want to call it, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, AI is not going to be gender specific. Yes, right? And then from then onwards, it, they will solve the big problems that we were unable to solve. Take things like um, global warming, right? It's a very, very complex uh, uh, problem from an energy point of view, from an energy storage point of view, from a renewal, uh, renewable energy generation point of view, from a transportation point of view, uh, from a logistics point of view, but from an economics point of view. Right? And, and, you know, the thing about our intelligence as humans is we have to specialize. Someone may look at it from a, 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 you know, an energy storage point of view and another would look at it from a logistics point of view if we can only put those two together. Right? And because computers are capable of, one, understanding all of the information out there. Imagine if you were solving problems with Google as your memory set.
right? Imagine if you're analyzing uh, problems with Wikipedia as your set of knowledge. Imagine if you could do that with the smartest people in the world, all of you connected, all of you with unlimited brain power. And give them the problem and say, okay, is there an interesting solution for this that we humans with our limited capabilities could not see? Of course, the first problem, uh, the first answer they'll come up with is, you guys did this, you know, you know you're the problem, right? Yeah, we are, honestly. But can we convince those machines that, you know, if they are our artificially in intelligent infant child, that mommy and daddy are sorry, and that we actually want to be happy and that we care to make others happy so that the machine would say, you know what, you're the problem, daddy, but uh, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to solve it for you, not against you. It's very possible, and it's not that far. So I actually woke up one morning, uh, honestly, after I, uh, I, I, I lost son, I lost my son Ali, uh, and I uh, was listening, as I always do, to the latest technology trends, working on Soul for Happy, and it just hit me uh, so hard. I mean, you know, people sometimes mistake Google for that big conglomerate that's trying to make money. Google truly is a movement that's trying to make a, the world a better place. I was trained heavily by our founders, Larry and Sergey, that this is, was all about doing good things. And making money as a result is fine, but doing good things. I have to tell you, I struggled with AI. I struggled with how can we program it differently? How can we, you know, uh, can we fire wallet and isolate it and protect ourselves? And no, there is no, none of that would work. And truly, the answer hit me that if we, are, if we show the correct value set in the data from which they're learning, when general intelligence is being learned, you know, in a, you know, maybe say 10 years' time, they'll just learn. Because, by the way, values are not emotions. Values are a set of intelligent decisions, right? The value set of a Saudi woman is to be covered because that's the way to fit within the community. The value set of a Brazilian woman is a G-string because that's the way to fit in the community, right? I, is either of them right and the other is wrong? No, it's just, it's just the, what the community teaches you, right? Now, what are we teaching the machines? Violence, bullying, uh, ego, uh, um, you know, individual centricity, uh, greed, right? These are the values we live by in today's world. And, and yeah, maybe they've propelled us to where we are as a civilization today, but I guarantee you they're going to put us at a distinct disadvantage in the future. They, they really need to be reversed. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we have never had a better time as humanity. Life expectancy is higher, quality of, li of life is higher. I mean, seriously, look at our smartphones and all those amazing things that I wouldn't have even thought I could touch in my lifetime. At, at your fingertips. In Solve for Happy, in, uh, you know, in my happiness equation, I discussed openly that happiness is not a result of what life gives you. Happiness results from a, an equation that is based on a comparison between what life gives you or the events happening in your life and your expectations of how life should behave, right? It, it doesn't rain in itself, doesn't make you happy or unhappy. Rain would make you happy if you wanted to, to, to water your plants, and it would make you unhappy if you wanted to suntan, right? The event itself is irrelevant. It's that comparison. In the modern world, something changed in our minds. We think that we've signed a customer service agreement with life somehow. It's like the more life gives us, the more expectation we have. It's like, hey, by the way, my boyfriend was annoying last Friday and I've been complaining for a week and you're not going to fix it. There is no agreement, right? And, and, and the more we expect from life, the more we start to be unhappy about what life gives us. That equation, the happiness equation, events minus expectations, is a survival mechanism, right? Your brain as much as we push it to become what it is today and invent iPhones and all of the stuff that we do, your brain truly is part of your survival machine. It's responsible to look at the world around it and decide if those events that are uh, uh, you know, facing it safe, are safe enough for your survival or not. Now, your, your brain has no benefit whatsoever if a tiger shows up to tell you, oh, how wonderful, look, beautiful animal. Right? It is a beautiful animal, beautiful anatomy, beautiful skin tones, right? But your brain wants to tell you we're going to die. It's looking for what's wrong.
all the time, right? And so even in the best of all situations, hmm, your brain will go like, ah, oh, but something must be wrong. I can't be safe. Like, if I'm safe, then I have no duty here. Do I go and sleep? No, I need to keep you know, on alert. I need to look for what's wrong. And so, you know, what used to be a tiger started to become a little bit of extra rain or a, or a, rude, a rude comment from, you know, the taxi driver or a, a slight tension between you and your partner at home. And all of these now pause as the tiger. This is, this is multi-layered, right? So there is the element of purpose, and, and I, I'd like to come back and talk about this. There is, however, the element of um, we are uh, uh, designed to look for what's wrong, and there is the element of the amount of information we're being bombarded with. So if you, if you lived in a tiny little village uh, by the river and you know, one week you couldn't find anything to eat, you had one topic to complain about. Now, you, you complain about Donald Trump even though you're Dutch, you complain about, you know, what's happening in, uh, you know, in, uh, in the um, um, British Brexit situation. You, you, you look at everything. There is so much, and let alone advertising and marketing and the fact that iPhone uh, uh, 7 is not good enough because your friend has an iPhone 10. And all of co constant reasons to tell yourself, no, 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 this is, not, this is not good. I need to strive more. I need to do differently. I need to have... And, and so multiply the amount of information we get with the tendency of, uh, to, 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 to analyze more because we have the time, and yes, take the topic of purpose and then start to ask yourself, wow, right? What's going on? Now, on purpose, I have to say, even purpose, and I say that with love and respect, has been messed up by the Western uh, uh, belief system. You know, the Western belief system tells us we shouldn't be happy all the time, we should just be successful. The Western belief system tells us to be critical of everything and look for what's wrong with everything. And you know what? We productize uh, everything, including happiness, so the Western belief system will say, forget happiness, that peaceful, content feeling you get when events are equal to expectations. You can replace that with fun. We're going to give you happiness in a little capsule. Just need to pay $10 on Netflix and you're going to be happy for a few hours. Or, you know, pay $40 on, 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 for a party. You're going to have a couple of drinks, jump, jump up and down. It will feel like you're happy, right? And put all of that together and then we even productize purpose. It's weird. So in the Western world, we are educated to look for a purpose in life and then find it, and then strive the rest of our life to achieve it or not, right? It, that's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. So I was educated about happiness by who? By my son. And my son was what? He was a video gamer, right? And you know what purpose in a video game is? The purpose of a video gamer is to be the absolute best gamer you can become. There's no winning the game. By the way, in life, there's no winning life. We come with nothing and we leave with nothing. There is no winning. Right? The trick is, can you become the absolute best gamer you have the potential of becoming? Now, to become the absolute best gamer you have the potential of becoming, you play. You engage in life. You go through the difficult tasks. You lose sometimes. You win sometimes. You learn from the challenges. And you know what's most, the most amazing part of it? When you're ready, when you're skillful enough, you'll get to that part of the game where the, where the boss is going to show up and your life's purpose will be to be that boss, right? Until you're ready, you're never going to get to it. And we think so differently about purpose. It's like, you know what? I want to give a laptop to every child, but you're an artist, you know, or you're a jazz music player. Where did you come up with that, right? Is there no purpose in playing jazz? Is there is absolutely a purpose in anything any of us can, we, can do. It's just the point of, can we be the best in the world at it? Can we the be, be the best that we can be at it, and then it becomes your life's purpose. Yeah, I, 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 took, I took every path you can take. Uh, I, I really, really, really was searching for happiness. I must have been the luckiest person ever because I had the luxury of taking those paths at a very young age. So at, at, you know, in my 20s, I started to become successful beyond my wildest dreams, and so I could afford anything. 
I did all of the you know uh, journeys and trips that people you know dream of. I had the title that people work years for. I had the bank account. I could buy any gadget, any toy, any car. I lived in a luxury place, and none of them worked. None of them worked. And by the way, most people will tell me, "Ah, oh, yeah, of course you can talk about happiness because you're rich." Seriously, don't even take me as an example. Remember when you just finished school and you said, if I have 100 euros a month, I'll be happy. And then you got the 100 euros a month and said, oh, it was just a miscalculation. I just needed 500 euros and I'll be happy. And then you go like, no, 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 100 more and I'll be happy. It doesn't make any difference. As long as you have your basic needs in life, I wear $19 t-shirts. I don't even care if I you know, have $1,900 for a t-shirt because the rest I don't need, right? And most of us spend most of our life um, uh, working so hard to make money, to pay for our ability to work so hard and buy a few things we don't need. But seriously? Why, why do we do that? I, I, I honestly don't understand. Now, the real uh, a attempt to, you know, my, one of my biggest, biggest um, um, moments was when I bought my real first real, you know, fancy car, it was a BMW 520, beautiful, beautiful at the time for my age, I was 24, you know, 25, maybe, wonderful, right? And I sat in that car and I loved it. Like, this is so beautiful, I've arrived. I'm not making this up. As I was driving out of the showroom, there was a BMW 7 Series going past before me and I was like, and when will I have one of those? That's exact minute. The minute you get in the car and you look outside, what you have doesn't matter anymore. Now, now I will tell you, hmm, most of us will spend our entire, entire lifetime climbing a ladder just to realize at the end of our life that we're on the long, wrong ladder. It's really, really, this is what it is. I was hit early enough to realize that the ladder I should be on is the ladder of being happy. Right? And I, yeah, I may not be able to, at the time I was thinking, I may not be able to buy a Ferrari, hmm? but that's okay, because I actually prefer to be happy than to own a Ferrari. Funny thing is, when you're happy, you're more likely to own a Ferrari. So if, it, it, and I hope you will never make that decision when you can, by the way, but, but the, the funny part of it, no, the, no disrespect to Ferrari at all, but honestly, who needs a Ferrari in Amsterdam? Are you kidding me? Right? Like, seriously, why? And, and, and the trick becomes, when you're happy, you do things so much better in life. You build such better relationships. Everyone wants to help you. Everyone wants to work with you. Everything becomes easier. So you become successful. So, so to, to, to start with, even though some of us are interested in the environment and fixing that and others are interested in the future of AI and maybe others are interested in the security of the world or whatever, uh, those things affect all of us equally. Now, some of us step up uh, to solve the, um, the issues they're aware of, right? Uh, I'm extremely passionate about the environment. Uh, I believe we absolutely need to fix this, but my, uh, you know, they say if you're, a, if you're a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail. To my mind, if I manage to fix AI, then I'll fix the environment a few years later, or at least I'll take the right steps a few years later. This video marks the premiere of our extended feature showcasing the remarkable individuals we've highlighted across the Bright Vibes channels. If you found this video inspiring, show your support with a thumbs up and don't hesitate to share your thoughts on AI and happiness in the comments below. And if you're as enthusiastic as we are about uncovering these insightful interviews, consider hitting the subscribe button. No, don't consider it, just do it. By subscribing, you're helping us tremendously to help amplify the good in the world.